Today, I have an interview with my good friend Tetsu, a Japanese Taiwanese Canadian who has created the family life in terms of languages, which I could only dream of. He's raising his kids in five languages. Well, here, let's take a look what it's like at his house. And then here, how he does it. Hello, Tetsu. How's it going? Fantastic. Fantastic. Doing well. How about yourself? Great, great. It's a nice day here in Japan, a little bit cloudy outside. First, I'd like to talk about your ethnic and linguistic background and how perhaps that is what led you to want to teach or raise your children in five languages. Definitely. I was actually born in Hong Kong to a Taiwanese father and a Japanese mother. So right off the bat, I had Chinese, Mandarin Chinese and Japanese in my blood. You know, even though I was born in Hong Kong, I don't speak Cantonese. I actually just grew up in Taiwan. So mm-hmm. I was growing up in Taiwan, speaking Mandarin with dad, Japanese with mom, Taiwanese to the folks uh, in the street, some of my friends uh, in the neighborhood. And then we have Hakka because my father's side uh, is from Shinsu and they have Hakka. So those mm-hmm. four, and then they sent me to an American school. So I had five languages growing up, uh, you know, in, in Taiwan until I was 13 years old. And then they sent me to, to Canada, like where I am right now, uh, in the province of Quebec, <laughs> out of all of Canada, uh, they sent me to Quebec because my aunt, my, my father's youngest uh, sister, married a Quebecer. So I came here to Quebec to start my high school. And then I went to all of high school, uh, university, graduate school, all in French, uh, and a little piece in, in English. Somewhere on the way, I picked up Spanish, uh, some German, some Italian, but maybe we can get into that later. But basically, I grew up with all these languages uh, in my life, uh, mm-hmm. very young. And I know the power of having a good environment to stimulate the learning. And so my kids, four kids, first one is 11, second one is 10, third one is seven, and the last one is three. And they Mm -hmm. all grew up speaking Mandarin with me, Japanese with mom. Mom is from Nagasaki. French in school, since we're in Quebec. And we actually brought in Spanish through a system called au pair, which are basically live-in nannies. They they live with us Mm -hmm. 24-7. Uh, and they would speak uh, Spanish to the kids all the time. They're from Mexico. That's English. constant exposure. That's a lot yeah, of input. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's right. And uh, do they ever get confused amongst the languages? I mean, at the various ages, you may comment on the various ages because you have mm-hmm. all you've you've grown up. They've grown up <laughs> doing this. Well, all of them have grown up in this. I mean, even the o- oldest one was yes. in this environment, right? Okay. Yeah, so. there was a little bit of a sequence for the uh, oldest two. Mm-hmm. We started first with Japanese and, and uh, English, uh, right. Japanese and Mandarin, and then we got English. And then when we came back to Canada, we added uh, uh, Spanish and French. Uh, right. But that's because I, when we got married, actually, my, my wife and I, we lived in Japan for a while. And then we actually went to Taiwan a little bit and we came mm-hmm. here. So that's mm-hmm. a little bit of background why we did that sequentially. But the second, but the, la- the last two, they were just born right into the five languages. So some people worry about kids getting confused Mm -hmm. hearing more than one language as a child. Yeah. What have you noticed? There is a little bit of period, uh, maybe a few months, I would say, uh, where the children would actually mix languages. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's just uh, through this this little period where they are sort of sorting out their languages because they're still like Mm -hmm. at two, between two and three or so they would have, they're still trying to think, okay, this is called Mandarin. No, this is called Japanese. They don't know that, like, theoretically. All they know is they have a lot of people talking to them in different languages, and they're sort of mm. sorting all that out. So there is that little period where they have that mixture. You know, this part is called code mixing. But other than that, uh, they sort it out very quickly, and then they know that Mandarin. And these are the words that I use with that. And this is called mm-hmm. Mandarin. 
and then the mom, Japanese. So they associate a language with a person. Correct. So this is uh, the methodology that's called one person, one language. So I, I know that relationships are important in getting children interested in speaking a language. The next question would be how you keep them engaged in all five languages. Well, if I, if I borrow a term that uh, Professor Stephen Krashen uses, it's compelling, right? We need to make this language use compelling to mm -hmm. them. So obviously, people that are close to them, the languages that these people speak with them is very important. So they will be compelled to use Mandarin with their father. <laughs> um, Japanese mom always speaks Japanese and they're compelled to speak Japanese. And then the nanny would speak Spanish and they'll have to use that Spanish if they want to build a good relationship. So this relationship, of, you know, this trust and this caring relationship is very compelling, very important to the kids. Even though we're in a French uh, province, they speak very good English because of these mm -hmm. different inputs. Right. Uh, French, if, if they, you know, go outside, all the friends are, are you know, speaking French. Right. Uh, their coaches, whether it's uh, hockey or skating or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. these are all compelling reasons to use this language. So anything they like and that is in that language, you know, mangas and, and whatever is in Japanese uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes. And also we go to that place like every summer we go to japan for a mm -hmm. few months and they go to a local school uh, and then we also go to taiwan for for two months uh every year so that these are different strategies that we use they're not all the same we don't use the same strategy for every language and we don't expect every language to be at the same level or have the same set of vocabularies we're not cloning mm -hmm. five languages the different so, usages they use them in different exactly. situations that's right because it's got to be relevant Right, exactly, exactly. So, so, Does the oldest one get more into a certain language because of a hobby or interest or relationship? Um, well, the first one spent a good part of the very early years uh, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So his Mandarin is stronger than the other, the other kids. For heritage languages, the kids usually follow this pattern of the oldest has the strongest you know, mm -hmm. uh, heritage language proficiency right. and the second one less and then even less in the fourth. Mm -hmm. But we still keep the same infrastructure. We still try to get them uh, to speak these languages you know, on a daily basis. Oh. Recent times, they've started to use English amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm not oh, sure right. why it's English. I thought it would be French because they're educated yeah. in French. Right. But it's actually English. Younger... Mm -hmm. You know, a few years ago, it used to be Japanese was the strongest language. Where okay, for the next question, I want to ask questions which people are most curious about. And I think people wonder, uh, when should they start? When can they start? I think in your situation, the children were born into such an environment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes. they started from birth. But yeah, uh, what's your general advice when they so, start learning various languages? The earlier, the better. I was talking <laughs> to, my, to my wife's tummy in Mandarin. If resources is an issue, sometimes... People would advise going later. More mature kids would learn languages faster. So you have to know what your objective is and how much resources and effort time, you know, that you can dedicate to it. What if a parent uh, speaks, uh, let's say, Japanese and English? Uh, should they switch languages? My advice is as much as possible, don't. On a daily routine basis, there are constraints. There are, you know, other people in the context. But in principle, in our home, I speak Mandarin with the kids. My wife speaks Japanese with the kids. What French they want? outside, Spanish with the au pair. We keep that structure, make that a habit that the kids, you know, develop and make it natural. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do see me speak Japanese with mom, you know, right. French with my friends outside. Uh, sometimes Spanish with the with the au pair. As much as possible, try to make it a good habit. So that they identify, they associate you with that language right. so that they don't have this choice, so to speak. Because if they do, chances are they're going to pick the language that's easier and mm -hmm. then eventually reject mm -hmm. the harder language. And it could be the one that you want them to speak. Can a parent teach a child a language that that parent is not fluent in? I, I discourage that. Um, the main reason why I discourage that is not just for the language per se, but also for the relationship that you'll build with your child. Mm -hmm. That I think is the most important aspect uh, of language acquisition. And if, if you feel comfortable enough to develop a good trusting relationship with your child, then I think you're fluent enough. But once again, the, the important aspect is, are you going to be able to have a good relationship in that language with the child? What if your child refuses to speak 
the language you're trying to yes, teach. We we get this a lot. This is this is it's it's a difficult situation. First of all, as I avoid that situation ever coming up. And mm-hmm. so far, so good. Knock mm-hmm. on wood. My oldest is 11. Uh, but like I said, you know, we, we try not to force language down their throats. We try to create an environment where they are compelled naturally to use the languages. So it's not a like a burden for them, right? Uh, but there are situations where you start later in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it could be a, a burden for the child. I have some experience with that. So this is an interesting side point. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you look yeah. at Tetsu. Tetsu, what passport do you carry? I carry a Canadian passport now. Okay. I carry a Japanese passport. <laughs> <laughs> My children were raised in Japan. The younger one for a while refused to speak English, except when he knew the other person couldn't understand Japanese. I didn't put such a fantastic effort as you have, <laughs> and, and your results are pretty incredible. Can your child learn by watching TV, YouTube, or reading comic books? They do. They learn English basically by watching YouTube with a minimal interaction uh, outside. It's better to supplement with actual human interaction. That's right. mm-hmm. much stronger. Uh, right. But uh, TV and 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 uh, YouTube or or comic books, all that is is compelling input to the children. So uh, it's not only better than nothing; it's much better than nothing. To sum it up, I think one of the most important points that you're making is relationships. A strong motivation for them to learn to communicate in that language is communicate with somebody who's important to them. Absolutely. If you don't have that bond. It's going to be very, very difficult. But once you actually, when you have that, it's very natural. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the kids are compelled to use the language and they'll use whatever they could. Uh, Because oftentimes when they're very young, they they lack vocabulary, you know, in certain languages. But they'll be able to, you know, borrow from another language or Mm -hmm. describe it in a different way. Uh, But they'll do whatever, the point is they'll do whatever they can to communicate Mm -hmm. with you in that language. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it, makes them, you know grow right and exactly exactly and for those people who want to know a lot more about uh, tetsu's experience and his advice i know you'll have a book on amazon right pampers to polyglot it's- you also you youtube channel you give a lot of advice what's your youtube yes. channel it's right here ask tetsu so oh. youtube but also have you know facebook and instagram so- we'll put all that social media in the description well thank you very Fantastic. much tetsu i appreciate your time thank you tim it's always a pleasure